So we've got services you shouldn't use, applications you shouldn't use, understand the web browsers are coming at you. <laughs> Products you shouldn't maybe, use. Your phone's maybe spreading things. Your toaster could be attacking you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should put our tin foil hats on. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs, and joining me is Donna Grindle of Carbon. Hello, Donna. Hello. I don't sound quite as raspy as last week. I know. You got rid of your Barry White uh, really vibe going on. I know. My singing career's over before it started. (laughs) (laughs) Well, at least this time I won't have so many where you're just kind of zoning and staring at the microphone, hopefully. I don't know about all that. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I don't know if we had more or less of those when you were sick. So, Well, I think that part of the problem, too, is I was sitting in front of a window. So, you know, the little... Squirrel. <laughs> yeah. That's a bad thing. I have it too. I know. Yeah, I know you know because you, you get, you, we go together down some rabbit hole. <laughs> Everybody does that, don't they? Not just me. <laughs> oh, so all right, in, then. in today's episode, we, we made a prediction, sort of, kind of, uh, back no, in we November. We just simply ask a question. Well, that's the same thing. You know, if I'm, you know, it's rhetorical for me, right? If I'm asking a question, I know the answer. Because <laughs> you don't want to hear anybody else's opinion anyway. No, I, I value everybody's opinion. As long as it's yours. <laughs> so in episode 128, back in November, we discussed whether or not the uh, signs of a coming cyber storm were happening. So today we're going to look at whether we're actually there <laughs> Well, we still have a little ways to go, but either way, it's getting a little intense out there. Yeah, I mean, it's three months. This will come out almost three months to the day of when we did that episode 128, mm-hmm. Is There a Cyberstorm Brewing? And, you know, there was a lot in, in the news then. There were a lot of things that we were looking at that just seemed like there was a lot of building going on. And we weren't the only ones seeing it. And right now, I don't know about you, but, you know, there's articles now about breach fatigue. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what we were talking about? And even I am like, another one? Another one? Yeah. So, it's it's pretty intense out there. All right. So, before we dive into that, let's do our normal housekeeping. And uh, so, we're going to talk about the boot camp. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about and, it first. Let's do that first, yeah. So, the HIPAA boot camp. Uh, we're doing a virtual edition this time, so no travel involved. If you're interested in the boot camp, you can go to thehippabootcamp.com, get more information. It's going to be March 13, 14, 15, and 21 and 22. So we broke these up into bite-sized pieces so that it would be easy to attend and get the information. The format's going to be, well, the first day is going to be a little short one. As Donna calls it, the rip off the Band-Aid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kind of a, yeah, made it a little bit easier to schedule. Yeah, and then the rest of them would be uh, three, four hours. No, they, like they, we're, we're planning on three. That's when we did the hour and a half on the first day. Okay. And then three hours on the rest, and hopefully we won't take that long, but we always leave room for questions and periodic rabbit holes. <laughs> right. And and so, you know, keep in mind, if you're attending this, this is not – a webinar where you're just sitting back and listening. This is an interactive classroom environment. So you get a chance to talk about things going on, ask questions, all kind of good stuff. Yeah. Open mic night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you do want to attend, uh, it's great if you have a uh, first a microphone and a camera. Not necessary, but it's good if you do. Otherwise, there's a call-in number. Uh, with a meeting ID that you'll have access to. But anyway, once you sign up, we'll give you all that information. But it's definitely going to be a very good event, as the other ones have been as well. So if you're interested in registration or more information, go to thehippabootcamp.com because it's coming up quickly. Thehippabootcamp.com or help me with hippa.com slash bootcamp. Yep. So. All right. So. More fun uh, than you ever can dream of. 
<clears throat> so go ahead and run down where you're going to be lately, and then I have a question that came in from a listener. Oh, okay. So I just finished uh, speaking at the uh, Ambulatory Surgical Center trade show, Georgia, South Carolina. It was it was really a great group, and uh, I really enjoyed speaking with them, and thanks for them having me. And uh, by the time this comes out, I will have also done a few other things. So my hall booth event and the uh, cybersecurity course for format approved that I do, cybersecurity officer, it will just be starting. But uh, we do a couple of those a year. And then March 16th, the Georgia Access Management Association, GAMMA, speaking with them about patient privacy. And on April the 22nd through the 25th is the JAWS Society Annual Conference in Newport Beach, California. I'm really excited to go out there. And in June, the North Georgia Medical Management Association in Dalton, Georgia, are the, um, the public events. I've got everything else seems to be booking as private right now. So, mm. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> people don't want to spend time with me in public. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought you'd have been booked for a private event? <laughs> uh, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So from the CA to the GA, you are covering the United States. <laughs> there you go. Got them all. Got them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Very cool. So uh, do you have anything else coming up that's not on the radar yet? Uh, no, nothing that I have enough information that I can share at this time. <laughs> that you can share? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it just creates confusion if you, you know, throw things out there that, you know what I'm saying. No. So, um, the other thing that uh, is new, and I'm sure by the time this comes out, it'll all be working, is we've gotten a lot of requests. Uh, we set up the Patreon site, and a lot of people, that has a recurring donation, and a lot of people ask for the ability to do a one-time donation. So, we're going to have that on the website. I don't know where you're going to put it there, David. <clears throat> it'll probably I just, guess. If, if you just go to the helpmewithhipper.com slash give, it'll be the, instead of going straight to Patreon, I'll just put another page there. and You can pick. So yeah. Patreon lets you do recurring, uh, and then we'll have a one-time donation option yep. there as well. We appreciate all the people eager to give us money uh, to keep the lights on, as David says. Well, yeah, but apparently, uh, according to George, famous listener there. The <laughs> donation that he wants to make is so that you can continue to uh, keep me in check. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I like it. <laughs> I did not know that it was costing her money to keep me in check. but <laughs> It's expensive to put up with you. There's a lot Look, of therapy uh, yeah. involved. <laughs> I'm sure. If not now, later, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that brings us to our listener question. Kind of interesting, and I don't know that we've covered this specifically, but the question, I'm just going to boil it down. The question was basically, as a business associate, this is an IT company, should he get business associate agreements with every vendor regardless, just make sure you kind of cover the whole gamut, right? Mm-hmm. And what, what did you say? Because you took that question. I said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> 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 no, um... Uh, I told him that that was not necessary. If company, a vendor, is not a business associate, you first, first of all, they shouldn't be giving you a business associate agreement, but you certainly don't want to open up a can of worms and establish that relationship of a business associate if that relationship isn't actually there. Yeah, it just creates a whole lot of mess. Yep. Because then you got to get out of that agreement. <laughs> right. You know? It's like once you're in one that doesn't really belong, I mean, I've found groups that have business associate agreements with the office supply company because they deliver paper. I was like, they bring it in the door. Are you paying attention to them or are you ignoring them? Uh, You know, that kind of stuff. But still, that's not persistent access to PHI like you expect in order to be a business associate. So you're right. We may need to do an episode on determining who is a business associate. Yeah. So I, I think maybe the the logic in that is that, you know, just to make sure nothing falls through the cracks, you do everybody. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that would open up a lot of a lot of issues as well. Um I don't I don't know anybody that recommends that approach. 
No, I, I wouldn't do it. And um, yeah, you know, part of me thinks, well, if you if you understand what a business associate is, it's not that hard to figure out if it applies to them. So I don't know if it's kind of a lazy approach, um, <laughs> or if mm-hmm. it's or if it's a fear approach. You know, I think a lot of it is is the fear approach that I'm going to make a mistake, so I'd rather make a, a mistake one way than the other. <laughs> Well, it's funny that, you know, we have people that either they don't want to do anything or they want to do way too much. (laughs) But I guess it's better to do the way too much, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, in the big picture, you're better off having one than uh, not having one when you need it. But at the same time, you're really better off understanding when you to do them and do them properly. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But you're right. I I still get a lot of questions about how do I determine if somebody is a a CE or a BA. Still get that a lot. Yeah, so we we, we may need to do one. And and it gets down to sometimes I actually need to see, let me see the contract between the two of you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's business arrangements between two covered entities, and one of them is a business associate. I just can't figure out which one. But somebody has to be, not both of you. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's that, uh that can bring up too about the information that goes to them. Like for instance, um, and when you accidentally fax a business associate information that they shouldn't have got, uh, is is yeah. that a breach or is it not a breach? Because you do have a BAA with them. So well, let's don't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> let's get back to cybersecurity. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> there you went, the squirrel. Uh, all right, so. Let's go back to uh, some, some things that are going on in, in the cyber storm. Of course, this time of year, we want to mention all the great tax scams that are out there. Yes. So this this is something that happens every year. Every year it gets worse. And the funny thing is, unless you're really paying attention, you don't see a whole lot about it. But it's there's a lot of information out there. But they, it tends to be mentioned once or twice. You might see it on local news. Hey, be careful, tax scam. And it kind of just goes away. I'm yeah. like, you know, I've been hit by not the scam part of it, but I've had more than once one of my ki- somebody has claimed one of my kids under taxes, and I've had to go through and fight the whole thing, and I end up getting you know getting it all figured out. But it's months take months for this to happen to get figured out. So and a lot of time, yeah, a lot of my yeah. account is time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you though that the uh, you know one of the things that people don't understand is. It's not just attacking the individual, it's attacking the businesses. Mm -hmm. And that really started last year. There were a ton of cases, uh, the W-2 scam, where they do spear phishing. It all involves spear phishing in in those cases, at least most of the time. And they ask for copies of W-2s as if it's the CEO asking the payroll department, give me copies of all the W-2s to review and they just send them right on out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, here they are so that you can review them. But what that means is now the criminals have a whole stack of W-2s that they can file on and, and get their tax refunds. And uh, they make them look really nice and neat. And by the time you catch them, that, you know, that bank account's closed and, and they've already gone. So, all right. so you've got that- those. You've got... They're trying to steal your tax refunds now. So even uh-huh. if you get your own, they're trying to find a way to get you to give it to them. Mm-hmm. And fraudulent filings, those we know about, that they just get your name, address, social security number, and they file as you, which is probably what happened with your kids. Right. But there's plenty of those out there, and they're aimed directly into financial areas which is good for healthcare because that gives them a little something to keep their eye off the <laughs> prize, so to speak. But, you know, it only lasts during tax season because after April that, that goes away and they start looking for new victims. And that doesn't mean that this year we don't already have that. Um, you know, there's articles like, uh, well, all scripts, of course. When all scripts got hit, they weren't the only healthcare entity to get hit. I I can assure you that there were hospitals and other places that got hit at the same time that all scripts did. Just take my word for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a headline article I saw during that time was ransomware actors cut loose on healthcare organizations. They weren't kidding. 
And it, it's a string of those attacks with the Sam Sam virus, and it's pretty intense stuff. And those ransomware attacks came out. Those started in the end of January, and we saw that spike of things happening you know, in November is what we were talking about. It seems mm -hmm. like things are building. Well, it's unfortunate, but it's probably continuing to build. I don't know if we've seen the end of it. With oh, no. Yet. I don't I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and, and of course, you know, we talk about how the prices of the Bitcoins and all of those things have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, ridiculous numbers where a handful of Bitcoins, that's, what, 30 something thousand dollars for a few bitcoins and uh so there's a new thread out there that's really starting to build cryptocurrency mining you want to try to explain that one <laughs> <laughs> uh the the mining part of it you know is is where um uh, people use computers and and they attach them to I don't know a whole lot about the intricacies of it, but they attach them to a service which you know uses the processing power of the system, which then in turn pays you in you know fractions of a coin, and then that goes into a, a repository somewhere. So um, something to that effect. Yeah. So the way these currencies are built is thousands upon thousands of math problems are being run all the time. So it uses the processing power of the computer to essentially create that money. And that's why they don't get created quickly because it takes all these computations. And that's why, you, as you're right, you get fractions of a Bitcoin even if you devote an entire computer to doing the math problem. So it's all about how much processing power can I get so that I can create more of these quicker. Mm -hmm. Well, they have now determined ways that they can use not only your computer, and on your computer they hijack web pages, and the web pages run programs. They've been crypto jacking, is I think what they're calling it, but they hi <laughs> uh, they <laughs> they get the uh, the web page there, and they say, well, you know, we're gonna at least for now, they don't get caught as quickly. They are able to do a program that's stealing your CPU when you're on that web page right. and doing those computations. But they're starting to spread it to Android devices and Internet of Things devices, which are, you know, your toaster, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> your, your, you know, all the cool uh, refrigerator that you can look at from the grocery store is doing that. Potentially. Or your Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the where things really come into play here is imagine that you're trying to do your work and one of the websites that everyone in your company utilizes for whatever reason to do their work, that website gets infected, whether that happens internally or to an external website. If the site gets infected and everybody's going to it, and it starts taking over all the processes or the processors, you think that's going to bring you to your knees? You betcha. Yeah. And see, from an IT perspective, that's like, we, you know, the dreaded call you get, my computer's slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, ah. Oh. Just a random, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why, yeah, it's my, slow. My computer's slow. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> but as much as, as we see that that is really building, and I think uh, I think the browser people will be able to find a way to prevent those JavaScripts from running. I hope all the vendors will, anyway. But right now, I mean, there's websites showing up every day. It's part of that uh, breach fatigue. Is hey, we found this many websites that were infected with this uh, JavaScript because they were able to hack the page and make the page serve the program. That was, you know, taking over every computer that went to it, yeah. grabbing the CPU cycle. So it can't work for you. It's now working for the criminals. Well, another thing to caution people about, if you don't already know this, which is when you do a Google search or any other search for anything, don't click on the ads. <laughs> 
those yes. those top you know three or whatever uh, results never click on those. I get calls nearly every day where it's funny because I pick up the phone and, and, and you in the background you hear the computer saying this is Microsoft. Please call the number on your screen. So I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, the computer's actually talking, and all it is is they they did a Google search, clicked on the ad, and it was an ad purchased by a criminal. Uh, and they mm-hmm. thought they were going to Walmart or MSN or whatever, but it took them to this page. And then once it gets on there, you, the only way to get off that page is to either use the end task feature or to reboot the machine. But people just sit there for you know an unlimited amount of time just not knowing what to do with it. So they just have it up on the screen. Yeah, talking over and yeah. over and over. Or they call the number and say, can you get this off my screen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's even worse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the ads... The ads on the side are some of the worst. Yeah. At least in the top, you pay more. The malvertising, yeah. as they call it. Yes, malvertising. And uh, that brings us, though, to the other area that we're starting. There's a lot of discussions about well, the way they phrase it is to make sure that you secure your supply chain. Hmm. In healthcare, that's called business associates in most cases, but you could have people that could affect your ability to do things that never see PHI. So, well, here's a great example. You hear about the Olympics and the opening ceremony got hacked? <laughs> yeah, I heard something about it, yeah. Yeah, so that happened, but the, they've ter- determined that the way they got in is the IT service provider themselves were hacked. Mm-hmm. So their MSP got hacked. So just saying... <laughs> And the South Koreans have to be pretty intense about cybersecurity because they got a neighbor that kind of attacks, does a lot of (laughs) cybersecurity attacks. So uh, the fact that their IT provider was hacked, which then they utilized that, they kind of hung out and waited and tried to shut down the opening ceremonies. And they're still tracking that one, but they have tracked it that far. So when you think about your providers, yes, your business associates, Hopefully, you're making sure you have those agreements and you're vetting them, particularly the high-risk ones, but you could also get infected by ones that aren't business associates, that have no reason to see PHI, but they're connecting into your systems, they're sending you attachments, they're doing all these things. Know that an accounting firm that does nothing with PHI could still infect you. And that also applies to small software providers. Well, I guess any software provider, because that's what happened with NotPetya last year, is a software provider in the Ukraine got infected in their automatic update. So it sent out that automatically from the software provider. Same thing with a popular cleaning software that uh, tech people like to use, CC. C C C C cleaner, <laughs> C cleaner, and uh, yeah. that software was compromised, and it's one that everybody has used for years, and it just never occurs to you that legitimate software are now getting their updates infected. So knowing that that could happen, even by people in your supply chain that have no connection whatsoever as a business associate. But if you're getting anything from them in, in a digital format, it's potential. Even in images, people don't understand that you can get infected with an image. Mm-hmm. You know, And those cute little gifts, those are running little programs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm just saying. Um, you got to know that all of those things are there. So this is all happening around you all day, every day. You just don't know about it, right? We do. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Well, I can tell you, though, one of the things that worries me is I reviewed a report, um, Malwarebytes, state of uh, malware. They they looked at the end of 2017 and made some 2018 predictions, but they had some statistics in there, and you know I love those. Mm-hmm. And they showed that there was this strange spike in spyware at the end of last year. And... It started in like July and August, but it's continued. They don't, Their charts only show through November, and it didn't seem to be going away. I mean, it went from less than 10,000 detections by malware bytes to over 50,000, and then 
Uh, and then over 40, it didn't drop below 20. It got down to 20,000 after July, but that's as low as it went. Well, to me, that means they're out there scouting the networks. Mm-hmm. You know, so we haven't seen it all yet. So when we were making that case about <laughs> the storm coming in November, the spyware was actually out there and they were doing their thing, uh, monitoring organizations. Yeah, that's the scary thing because that then can be used for some of these phishing attacks because they're paying attention to who talks to who and who has what data. They could be paying attention to every little detail and and they actually have cases where they hacked the voicemail, you know, because everything's VoIP now, everything's online. Hack the voicemail, listen to voicemail messages between senior officials in a company and use the information to short stocks. Hmm. I know. And wow. people say, well, yeah, I don't have to worry about it. It's just a voicemail. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a voicemail. It's yeah. just on a computer. So that spyware detections, I don't think we are even close to seeing what's actually going on with all that spyware because that we didn't have a lot of that for a long time. And then all of a sudden it shoots up out of nowhere. And the same time, hijacker detection shot up where they're, you know, hijacking the websites and those kind of things and malware that's uh, using the computer for nefarious acts. <laughs> that is interesting, though. They, they kind of went hand in hand. Yeah. When you look at those stats and they show business, because the good thing about it is it divided it between consumer and business. And a lot of times you look at these stats and that they're blended together, so it's really hard to tell how much is you know business versus you know grandma and grandpa got their computer now they're mixed in with consumers, and those cases you know completely different statistics than business ones as far as what you know we do in our jobs, and it was ransomware detections had a spike, but it dropped off when. Uh, all of these others went up, mm-hmm. which I thought was, when you look at them all together, it kind of gets scary. Yeah, and I'm, I'm seeing that of the, you know, the top 10 detections for business, that the hijacker detection was number one for business, and then the adware was number one for consumers. Right. That's interesting as well. So it's, it's things are cycling back around. It's like once you get good at, stopping them from what they're doing now, then they cycle back around and get some of these old ones, which no one's worried about for mm-hmm. a while, and they find new ways in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an ongoing battle. So to ever think you've got this covered, that's, you know, that's always my concern. Anybody that says, I got this, we're locked down, we're secure, nothing to worry about, they are the ones that scare me the most. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we're we developing right now in our IT company a an enhanced or advanced security offering and stance, too, that is just going to go way above and beyond, you know, the typical antivirus and threat management and, and all the typical things everybody likes to tout as being security because mm-hmm. it's... You can't you can't continue to do the same things when everything else is evolving. The threat is evolving. We can't continue to doing the same things, right? And it, well, you know, and that's another episode we need to do. Compliance is not security. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, and and that is something that people. Oh well, we're secure. We follow HIPAA. We 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 have to do HIPAA, so we're secure. Mm, no, I mean HIPAA is the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. It is not security by any means. And if you're just worried about compliance, you will never be secure. That's for sure. Yeah. But well, these are so, typically the same people that want a checklist, right? They I yeah. just, just want to check the box, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just tell me where to look. Well, obviously, where to look changes every day. How can we do that? Which brings us to <laughs> another one. And now I've already forgotten how to say it. <laughs> Hallway. 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 <laughs> Huawei. The Huawei. <laughs> Huawei. No, Huawei phones. It's a Chinese phone maker. And uh, just this week, 
here's another scary thing. Uh, the heads of six major U.S. intelligence agencies have warned American citizens not to use products and services, services tongue tied, mm-hmm. uh, made by Huawei and ZTE. Now, you and I see those things all over the place. Yeah. I, I don't have them, but uh, it's just never been one I've picked. But apparently, the intelligence community is starting to really see. Uh, some issues, primarily because Highway was actually founded by a former engineer in the People's Liberation Army of China, mm. you know, that he, he may have, <laughs> and they may be an arm of the government no. in China. So, you know, there's there's a deep concern there that those uh, phones and, and other services, because they do have software and tools that they offer, that, um, you know, those are more or less just bugging the United States as, as we do it and potentially spreading malware as well as capturing every move and all those kind of things. But it is the second biggest smartphone maker. So actually Samsung's number one, then them, and then Apple. Wow. So, Wow. There's a ton of them out there. Hmm. But it's highly recommended not to use them. <laughs> and if six, six different intelligence agencies, and we got a bunch of them, and mm-hmm. all of them say, mm oh, no, you shouldn't, I would definitely um, kind of pay attention yeah. to that. And if you've got one, get rid of it. Well, and maybe it. not uh, just transfer everything off of it. <laughs> So, so the United States is not the only ones that have government issued phones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you put your tinfoil hat head on for a second, I mean, you do think about it. Look, if if the government wants to really eavesdrop on everything you're doing, then give away phones. <laughs> <laughs> I right? know, really. You know, that's the way to do it. Which is a perfect segue into the other topic, and uh, that that goes along with this because we get this question about using Kaspersky. Antivirus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, that gets heated in the IT forums. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the, here's where here here's everybody asks my opinion, of course, you know, for clients and in in when I'm giving a talk or whatever. But my answer is, I don't necessarily think that the Kaspersky company itself is necessarily, uh, they've done great research, they do great things, uh, they contribute uh, a massive amount of information into fighting malware. Mm -hmm. They seem to be good people as far as you can count on them to secure things. But here's the other side. (laughs) Mm -hmm. If I had asked Microsoft and Apple and all of Google and all these other companies if they were aware that the CIA and the NSA were loaded up on different things that they could do to your software to use it to spy on people before WikiLeaks and the shadow brokers and those kind of things, they would have probably said no. And if our government is capable of those things, and I'm not saying that was shocking, I'm just saying if our government can do it, are you going to tell me that Putin's not doing it. And secondly, if he goes after a few of those engineers and says, you don't work for them, you work at their office, but you work for me, based on a lot of news, you know, you could assume that telling him no means you just disappear (laughs) one day. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that you'd seem to do. So it's not the company, it's the political environment that the company exists And is there any way that they can truly prevent that from happening? Well, I can't make that argument at all, Mm -hmm. that there would be any way that that's not happening. And then you add to the fact that the software is not just an application. It's one that's monitoring everything that's going on on the computer. Yeah, and it's it's sending information of some sort Mm -hmm. in order for it to be analyzed. Yeah, so whether... They're doing it uh, on purpose. It doesn't seem to be the case. 
And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make that argument one way or another. No one has offered any evidence that they are intentionally, you know, working with the government as it appears that this uh, hi- highway, <laughs> <laughs> highway, well, it's not my job to say those words correctly, but, you know, that they seem to be very much tied in since the founder was a military guy off, and they never, you know, once you're in the military, you know. Yeah. And, well, uh, the other thing, too, so, from a risk assessment standpoint, you have to kind of say, all right, whether I believe it or not, you know, can I really continue to use these products or services now that I know this? Mm-hmm. Am I willing to accept that risk? Right. So, it, that, you know, it, I know those heated discussions happen, but that's, to me, the bottom line is, no, I, you can argue all day long and prove that they are not intentionally doing anything. What you can't prove is that their government isn't doing something that they don't know about. Mm-hmm. That's really all you got? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got services you shouldn't use, applications you shouldn't use, understand the web browsers are coming at you. The products <laughs> Your phones you shouldn't may use. be uh, <laughs> just spreading things. Your toaster could be attacking you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe we should put our tin foil hats on. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I need to. You know, uh, file your taxes early so other people don't get a chance to do it first. I know. And then this morning I read some story about the Department of Defense releasing a UFO video. What's coming? I mean, I just, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next episode is how to make your tinfoil hat. <laughs> and you can tell how old we are because we say tinfoil. I know. Aluminum foil. <laughs> Uh, but I have made one of those before because I have a friend that uh, from college that gets into all those conspiracy things. So I actually sat down and made a hat one night. I'm not going to tell you what else we were doing that night, but obviously. <laughs> have you ever tried to chew the stuff, though? It'll, like, shock the crap out of you. <laughs> Why would you do that? Because we used to do that to people. Like, here, chew this stuff. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, See, there you go. I thought I was admitting to some little weirdness by making one of the hats, but uh, clearly. Yeah, look, back in the high school days, you remember, I'm from Cal Timby country, so we don't have a lot to do out here. <laughs> I'm from Cal Timby country, too. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, snipe hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's clearly a crazy environment out there. And yes, things are getting more and more complicated, but that doesn't mean that your security has to be more and more complicated. It just means you need to be more aware and making sure that you have those layers of protection in place that should already be there. Mm-hmm. You can protect yourself from all of these things. I mean, so far, David and I have been able to protect ourselves from all of these things. We think so, anyway. <laughs> I have not been hacked, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, as far as we know, you know, we're good to go. So it's doable. But you have to have layers of protection in place. You have to be aware of these things. Go back to our episode about cybersecurity outside the office. Worry about, uh, you know, locking down your home network. Don't just assume you don't have to do anything. And if you don't understand how to do it, there are people, you know, dollar nerd, everybody knows one, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that can try and secure it. Any security level is better than none. Well, the great thing about it is, Really, in most cases, being diligent and being educated are the top things. If you can do those two things, you know, educate your workforce and just be diligent about anything and everything, it, it just it makes a major. I mean, it's like eighty percent of the of the battle. Mm-hmm. Train, train, train. Yeah, I think we've talked about that once or twice. Yeah, <laughs> if, if training is the key. Mm-hmm. If you look at statistics on how ransomware gets in. The top three things involve an individual doing something. Yeah. Well, Not I, the criminal, the individual. I saw uh, an article recently, maybe last week, where you know Microsoft uh, did a study and they decided that training is the most important thing to cybersecurity. And I'm like, dude, we've been talking about that for a long time. <laughs> Duh. I mean, we don't, <laughs> and we didn't do a survey or a study. 
<laughs> just, I saw one that the University of Delaware had this big announcement. They had done a study, and they found that when people were in a bad mood, they were less likely to follow the cybersecurity requirements and and uh, have uh, cybersecurity failures. I'm like, duh. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody in a bad mood, they're more likely to screw up. They're more likely not to pay attention because they feel bad. They're in, they're cranky. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody's cranky, you know, do do a song and dance, something, make them feel better because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. offer comedy hour at lunch, something, yeah. trying to make people feel better. Put a stress pod in the, <laughs> in, the in the conference yeah. room. <laughs> well, no, there's a reason they do that. You know, home life affects work life, and people pre- try to pretend it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, but more so home affecting work, I think, than work affecting home because it, it really, people bring it to work and everybody tries to pretend, oh, no, I don't ever do that. Especially if you work from home. Yeah, I know, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we've done our job trying to scare people. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we could come up with a lot more scary things to say. And yet again, here we have an off-season Halloween episode. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes knowing what you don't know is the whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Accepting being, that you don't know what you don't know is really the most important thing. Yeah. You know, being educated. Mm-hmm. So That's why I read every day. Every day. So we read so you don't have to, is what David always says. Yeah. So you are no longer ignorant. At this point, if it happens to you, it's stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's no man. longer ignorance. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because uh, yeah. it'll happen yeah, to me tomorrow, always... and I'm like, ah. <laughs> I know. And, and let me just tell you, if it does happen to David, we're going to broadcast that left and right. <laughs> you'll never know, I promise. <laughs> no, you'll have to give it up somehow. I got Anton to tell me. Oh, whatever. All right, that's our show for today, folks. Please remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site. Rate us on our podcasting apps or anywhere else you want to rate us. Uh, You can also send an email in to Donna talking about how she needs to get paid to deal with me or whatever you want to. I loved it. You can also send your questions and uh, ideas in to contact at helpmewithhippa.com and uh, we might just read them and answer them. Who knows? So for Donna and myself, remember, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims, the show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.